just the worship we've had, a really good example of community and how much God wants to be with us. Mm. I think um, we'll chat a little bit more about it later on, but God is so evident when we come and we lay ourselves before him. Like He wants that relationship with us. He is a God who loves us. <coughs> Psalm 139, he was saying, Josh, he loves us so intimately. He knows the details. He knows the hairs on our heads. He knitted us together. Um, and yet he is this big creator, all-consuming, incredible, awesome God. And he wants that relationship with us. So I am chatting this morning a bit about that conversation, that transition, the difference between isolation and community. And when I was thinking about it, um, the first place I was kind of drawn to was thinking about, well, what kind of person are you? Um, I don't know if you've seen those personality tests and uh, forms and quizzes that you can fill in online. Some of them kind of create you as distant characters or what car you might be. Um, one of the questionnaires that's used often in the workplace is called Myers-Briggs. And the biggest distinction they give you there is the difference between an introvert, who is someone who probably gets their energy from having a bit of a quiet time, um, versus someone who is an extrovert who will get that energy from being surrounded by people and being like yeah, in the hustle and bustle of it all. I don't know which one you are. Um, I know which one I am. <laughs> and I'm always in that juggle. I think having lockdown over, over COVID, um, I think most people would think that if you were an introvert over that time, it would be not a dream, but actually you would get along with it okay because you like that time to yourself. And for an extrovert, that would be incredibly awful and challenging and tricky because you have no one to meet with and have coffee with. Um, however, having spoken to lots of people, I think actually lockdown kind of leveled that and we all faced a new reality of what life was like and how we dealt with it and responded to that. That novelty of working from home, not needing to get changed all day, <laughs> uh, watching endless box sets, <laughs> coffee or lunch dates that are now on Zoom, uh, Zoom quizzes and activities. Who took part in a Zoom quiz? Yeah, quite different, right? Um, and maybe the more beneficial things, like actually spending time with God, digging into the Word, praying, getting outside and walking, worshipping, which were great things as well. Um, but there was something still missing, and people really lacked that sort of human contact. The lack of human contact was like isolation. We, we spoke about being isolated um, and separated from each other. And isolation is lonely. How about when you, what sort of thing do you get when you walk into a new room full of people? Maybe <coughs> a networking event, uh, a new class or a new group that you might start, maybe even joining the church. <coughs> I'm sure that there are some people that love doing that. Um, I don't. So <laughs> I usually pause before I go in. I take a deep breath. I might run to the toilet and just calm down, <laughs> put a smile on, and when I feel ready, I will walk back in. For me, it takes time to build friendship, to feel comfortable, to be in a community. And even the last few weeks, I was starting a new job, and um, this brilliant organisation, I'm down at Bristol Hope, incredible people. <coughs> and I had to remind myself those encouraging words, Josh, that you started the year with, um, as we think about identity. To stop being defined by what I do, and instead define what I do by knowing who I am in Christ. That when I'm sat in a group of totally different people that I've never spent time with before, I'm not sitting about what my job is or what I do at home. I'm sat there because Christ has given me that opportunity to be there, that my identity is in him and he has gifted me with things. But how quick is it to lose hold of that when you've been out of your comfort zone? Despite the growing disparity between rich and poor across the UK, many do still live in a level of comfort, I suppose, or with an opportunity compared to the rest of the world, the majority of the world. Also depends probably on where you live in the UK. I think that's fair to say. Support services, access to education and healthcare can be variable, but hopefully are there. We're also taught to be quite independent as people, that we can do anything that we put our minds to. That's definitely how I was brought up and what I was told. And so our society is pretty individualistic. I wonder if in becoming more comfortable and being on our own, in our independence and potentially 
moving a bit further away from everyone else because we're striving to go yeah. where we want to go? Are we at risk of settling and losing something of what God has created us to be? And what seems to be that comfort and independence, there's actually some shocking stats in the UK um, that have been kind of drawn to relationships and being on your own. It's thought right now in the UK, at any one time, there are one in five children who are not in school. That's in secondary school, and that's a pretty high stat. So if you think about a class of 30 kids, you're looking at about six kids that are ill at school, either due to mental health, well-being, anxiety, illness, and bullying. Some of that is linked to social interaction. And just to put it in perspective, before COVID, that was a stat that was about one in 10. That's a huge change. I think church leaders and pastors that I've spoken to over the last couple of years um, in all different spaces in my previous job, they feel a bit challenged because the church hasn't filled back up in the way they thought it was going to. When we had lockdown, everyone was so excited because people were online. And it was brilliant, it's amazing, and new people were hearing about God. But when it came to actually stepping foot in the church and coming together, there was a little bit of a, a heaviness. The excitement wasn't there. The, um, compulsion to come together didn't seem to be there. I think most people appreciated the Sunday morning line and being able to watch catch up on YouTube when they had the chance. And even when we think about our elderly, it's much better for them to have interaction and with a, a wide range of people. There's been a couple of studies that have happened in numerous years. Um, a recent study looked at three over 300,000 people followed them for an average of well, around seven and a half years, their journey, and they indicated that those with adequate social relationships have a 50% greater likelihood of survival compared to those with poor or insufficient social relationships. The magnitude of that effect is the same and is comparable to quitting smoking, which we've often spoken about and you often hear in adverts or news or press and health. And it exceeds many other factors that we know of, such as obesity and physical inactivity. And what's really shocking is that a similar scenario is found when thinking about newborn infants. If they don't have um, appropriate social care, so not just their needs met, but actual social interaction and relationships, they really struggle um, to grow into the season life. But we've been aware of it for a while, really. It's good to talk. Does anyone remember, like back in the 90s, there was that advert, BT advert with Bob Hoskins? The strap line, it's good to talk. We knew about it. The definition of isolation is to be alone and apart from each other with distances um, separating us. Maybe that's between beliefs and things we do or physical contact. Whereas when we share beliefs, we share space, we share time, ideas, interests, that's where we build community. When we take our eyes off God and the people that he has put around us, you start to only really look at yourselves. And we already know that we are not perfect creatures. So why is this so important to God? We can talk about the human aspect, and we've heard a bit about that. There's four things that are on my mind. Um, God's kingdom, his love, that he's relational, and that we're made in his image. And we've spoken a bit about God's, God's kingdom. Um, and how actually to be part of God's kingdom means that we live in his domain. He is the king and he needs to have people and uh, a world within his domain to be part of that kingdom. So he's already created a concept of community, the concept of being and being together. Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.20 would call us ambassadors of Christ. We're adopted into a family made of many parts. And being in that community is a great, brilliant example of how people actually see God. <laughs> we spoke about how when we live as kingdom, when we live out the kingdom, people get a glimpse of who God is. God is love. 1 John 4, 8. That Martin, you mentioned it the other week. That God is love. And that's something he calls us to do, to be active. And we know it's active. It can't be done on your own, in your own place. You can't sit in your living room and love. Well, I can't quite think how you would. Um, but it's just not as real. You need to be with people. It's an active thing to engage. So you can only love in community. We mentioned about God being relational. And I think um, that really comes back right to the beginning. 
that we know our God um, as a trinity, as three. He isn't on his own, it's not one being. And even in John we read, in the beginning was the word, and the word is with God. So our understanding of who God is, it's not one individual just creating everything. Actually, we have three entities that work together, they fellowship together, they talk, they commune. And he wants a relationship with us. He gave his son for us because he wants a relationship with us. God, it's all about community. And that God, we're made in the image of God. The Imago Dei. And when God created Adam and Eve, he said, I created man in, in, in my image. And in creating us in his image, we feel, we be, we hopefully hold some of those traits and characteristics of who God is. And he also said, man cannot be alone. And created a farm. To multiply, to have many people. We are image bearers of God, and he wants us to multiply, to be community, to be a group that follow and look after him. Look out for him and towards him. But what does it take? It's quite hard sometimes being in a community and fellowship. We all have to get along. Oh, that's not always that easy. We might disagree wholeheartedly with what someone else is saying. The Bible is full of imagery and examples of fellowship and community. The disciples are probably, I want to say, the, well, maybe the best. I think probably one of the best examples of people that gather, they come together, they talk about the word, they live. And even them have, they have lessons to learn when you think about feeding of the 5,000. Someone stepping out into community to offer what they had. It went far and stretched wide. But the disciples probably questioned that at the time. The Last Supper, how they got together and broke bread. All the little stories in the gospel about looking out for each other, even the lost sheep. You have your whole flock, but you go and look for that lost sheep. You bring that back to where they are, the community that's there. No one goes astray, no one is forgotten. When I was thinking of today, that story um, of Zacchaeus really stuck out to me. Sometimes I have to question whether it's because I'm hearing the kids talk about it in Sunday school. <laughs> <laughs> but it stood out to me. Uh, because he was a guy who was doing his own thing, being quite individualistic, working his way up, taking money, uh, not really that friendly to the people around him. And then he saw Jesus and had almost like a conversion moment. His, his, the scales in his eyes were lifted effectively. He saw what he was doing and he saw the people around him. And Luke 19.8, it says that Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look. Here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Which is incredibly sacrificial. I'm not sure I would feel confident offering that. Um, or maybe Zacchaeus could have had some really strong investments for all the money that he took and had a great return. <laughs> but I don't know the line that it was probably pretty sacrificial. And if not sacrificial, humbling to say, actually, I have done wrong and I am paying. It shows his understanding as a result of that change and coming in contact with Jesus of what it means to live in community. That you're not taking and you're not um, kind of abusing that relationship, but you are feeding back into, you are giving into, you are enhancing and getting around others. That you love them and that you treat them well. And there are also a number of interactions that have been left um, in the Bible for us about what community looks like. And there are about six pieces of paper that I have dotted around. You might have avoided the chairs that they were on. Um, so if you have a piece of paper next to you, please do pick it up. There are a couple of bits of scripture, and they should be numbers. Let me see. Can I see six hands in the air? Are there six hands? I've got six pieces of paper. We're missing, we're missing one. Oh, no. Brilliant. So there it, it will start. They're numbered. So there should be a number one somewhere, and that's Acts. Reading from Acts. Who's that? Christy. That's me. So, <coughs> they devoted themselves to the apostles. So sorry, it's Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by apostles. Sorry, performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke
break bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Wow. Thanks, Kanika. We really like that. With the Lord be adding to our number daily, or who we see in this congregation. That was us out living that. What are there any words that kind of stick out to people from that that scripture? Anything that feels like a challenge? Devotion. That's a real discipline, isn't it? Because it's not just whenever. It's like you set a rhythm and you do it. It's not that hard. Is there anything else? I guess the selling of the property and possessions. Bread together regularly. They ate together. We do that a bit as a church in different settings. <laughs> they prayed <laughs> and they met daily. Wow. Like, that's, that's actually quite hard, I think, for all of us to meet daily. Um, it makes me very much think about the worship in the morning that you do during the week, Sophie, and just how that's an opportunity for people to come together daily in the morning. Okay, number two Colossians. Who has Colossians? this. I, I definitely need glasses. Uh, 2 Colossians 3, 11 to 17. Circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and de dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another, with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thanks, Nick. And what a great thing that is, that actually it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is from, what you've experienced, whether you're slave or free, whether you're Gentile or Jew, Christ still loves you. And you are in the church and you're part of that community if you've accepted Jesus as your saviour. And then that whole list, uh, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. I mean, that's quite a list. Um, and so I think for some of us, I mean, for me, that probably depends on the day I'm having and how we've got up and out the house in the morning and what conversations have been going on. Um, and it's something that I feel I always need to work on. They aren't things that necessarily come naturally to bear with each other and forgive one another. It's not a challenge to you. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. <coughs> Let Christ dwell among you richly, to admonish each other with wisdom, teach wisdom, pray, uh, psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing to God with gratitude. Okay, number three, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 20. One Corinthians twelve, twelve to twenty. Just as a body, 
though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. <coughs> That's one of my favourite verses, scriptures. Because um, I think it would be really easy to forget that all of us have a vital role to play in our community, in our church. Um, I think there are often roles that get overlooked, like the fact that you can sit down this morning, that you can walk in and, and perch quite comfortably rather than standing. Someone has been here to set that all up, to set the mics up, to put their instruments out, to practice worship, to run through what the service might look like, to pin down people to speak. There's a lot of preparation that people don't see, and if some of those elements are missing, if you came in this morning with nowhere to sit, I think there'd be a bit of a kerfuffle going on, and chairs being shuffled out, and a bit of a... I don't even start it this morning, what are we going to do? You know, we knew that we'd jump to it and get it all in place, but it takes that bit of time. There are things that make church run smoothly, make community happen, the teas and coffees. Everyone has a role to play, you won't always see it. You should never think of your role as not being important, because it is, it's vital, and God sees it and God knows. And without you doing your part in the church, there'll be something missing, whatever that might be. Okay, number four, John 13, 34 to 35. It's a bit shorter this one. John 13, 34 to 35. <coughs> a new command I give you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. <coughs> By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The challenge of loving when maybe you don't feel like it, when you've got a big group of people. But this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Number five, Romans 12, 9 to 18. <coughs> love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour for serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. <coughs> Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. <coughs> rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. <coughs> Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So if anyone has any thoughts, they can share them with him and And then give a chance out to them particularly.
I was just thinking that um, if you lived in a community like that, it would be nice as a recipient uh, to uh, be on the receiving end of, of people like that. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're called to give it, but, but from a, somebody coming in uh, and maybe for the first time uh, to experience a community like that would be truly wonderful. Rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. Because sometimes we're quite happy to do the rejoicing bit, but we might not want to go alongside the way to people pay. Mm -hmm. But but that we call to do that as well. And that requires a little empathy, doesn't it? And a little compassion and uh, and vulnerability amongst people. Mm -hmm. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. sure we've done our responsibility but then if that if that is productive then we can we know we've done what we were responsible for. Mm -hmm. That can be hard to see sometimes. Some of you can carry it can't you? But doing what you can do and giving it to God I think you can sort of work in it. Again for me there's a volume to one another just with us. Again not the reason Because there'll be lots of things that knock us off that, right? Lots of things to distract us, to take over our day, to split, to cause confusion, to make us feel heavy hearted. But that discipline of coming back to devote to each other. Okay. The last one, number six, Galatians 6, 1 to 2. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfil the law of Christ. Actually, it sounds like quite a heavy one. I didn't read any of my number six. <laughs> Isn't that interesting, that challenge? I think often we don't want to be challenged. Um, when we're doing things wrong, we try and rush it onto the carpet. If someone questions us, we think, why are you challenging us? Um, we can get quite defensive. So that idea of challenging it gently, approaching something gently, being watchful of ourselves, the vulnerability in that again, alongside carrying each other's burdens, because actions often come from somewhere else, don't they? There are usually things going on in our lives that create different actions and responses to the other. Thank you, readers, for reading those verses. In preparing, I was thinking about what all, what all the key things that we could point in the direction of the community. And I think, you know, you could write the most beautiful essay about what community is like. But those verses in the Bible really identify some of the key characteristics that we want to be able to learn and grow and inhabit and encourage in each other. A few months ago, I was talking to a close friend of mine um, who has mentored me in different ways. He'd moved over to the UK from Hong Kong, um, and when he was younger, I can't remember what time period this would have been, his family moved from mainland China to Hong Kong in hope of something better. There was a lot of oppression um, on mainland China, and so he was looking to make that move at that time. And he was reflecting on how tough it was. But he said no one was afraid to ask. Asking for help was normal. If you needed food or money or clothes, or maybe you needed someone to help you do something, maybe it was to cook a meal or um, to help you mend something or transport you somewhere, that it wasn't frowned upon or questioned. That everyone had experienced some sort of hardship or difficulty, and that they knew that they would only all progress by helping each other. They were appreciative of what had happened to them and kind of passing that gift on a little bit. It's like an act of kindness thing, isn't there? We encourage to pass acts of kindness on. And that really challenged me because I don't really like asking people for things. Okay, I, like, I don't like asking for other people and say, can you do this and help me with this? And, but if it's for me, I feel quite challenged. And so I feel that's quite a vulnerable thing where you have to be able to admit the things that you need help with, things that we can't do um, in the way that society tells us we should be able to do and actually seek help for that. 
In my travels, I've often met families where the main earner in a quite a large family would be paying for nieces and nephews to go to school, to go to university, sometimes internationally, at really quite huge costs, but very quietly sacrificial. People wouldn't know, only that family would know. And I met women who come together in savings groups, and uh, they I mean, have a lot of relationship built there and encourage each other. And they come, they pull their resources, they say, actually, I'm going to give you some of my money into a pot, because together we can use that to do something else. They reinvest the money back into the pot. It goes out multiple, they take it in turns. They can fund their kids going to school, they can pay for healthcare, they can see their kids go off to university as a result. It requires them to sacrifice first, but to do it together. And I remember from a young age, hearing my mum chatting, because she chats a lot on the phone to her family, um, she was sat there chatting um, about how much money she was going to send back to her family church in Trinidad. It was to help fund a minibus, and I should caveat that a minibus really was a pickup truck with benches and a nail inside. It's a little bit scary when it's um, I think my dad was a little bit panicked. Um, she, was, um, she was chatting away about that, and I remember sitting next to her, I was probably about six or seven, being really annoyed because I had given her my Christmas wish list of what I wanted. And there was she talking about what she was doing in order, in order to help the church grow. I think all those examples require personal sacrifice, and community requires personal sacrifice. But within those examples, and within who we are as a community, we know that as a community, we are more than any one single person might be. If you look around this room, there are things that people, but things that people can do, and gifts that people have, that you don't have. We are bigger, and mightier, stronger, as a community than as one. A concept I was introduced to a while ago, um, it's a Swahili word, so I'm really sorry if I pronounce it wrong, um, called Ubuntu, U-B-A-N-T-U. It roughly translates to mean, I am because we are. And I love that because I think in the UK we have it, you know, we talk about community and groups of people and supporting each other. <coughs> but I think this phrase, I am because we are, has a totally different emphasis on what community is. Desmond Tutu explained it um, in one of his speeches. He said, the essence of being human, Ubuntu means, speaks particularly about the fact that you can't exist as a human being in isolation. It speaks about our interconnectedness. You can't be human all by yourself. And when you have this quality of Ubuntu, you, know, you are known for your generosity. You are open and available to others, affirming of others. You don't feel threatened, and that others are able and good, based from a, form, a proper understanding of your self-assurance that comes from knowing that he or she, you or I, belong to a greater whole. You belong to something big, bigger. You belong to this community. And it's diminished when others are humiliated, or diminished, or tortured, or hurt, or influenced in bad ways. You feel the weight of that. And I just thought that was a really beautiful way to think about what community is. That I am because we are. And what's beautiful, I know there's I think there's a whole philosophy around, around it, but what's beautiful for us is to think I am because we are here in this room, and we are because of our God. So as I close, Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near.